top two equations are energy balance equations. One of them is for the uh, control volume energy balance, and the second one is the surface energy balance. I'm going to work an example problem with that in just a minute, but for right now, on the homework, just so you know, it's due Wednesday, of course, the three problems that I, three of the four problems I assigned chapter one. Problem 123 said the power input to the transmission case is 250 watts. No, that's, it's not an electric car, and 250 watts is like a big light bulb, so that's not going to power anything. 250 horsepower. So change that number on the handouts I gave you to 250 horsepower. The uh, second problem, 130, said a cylinder is in a large room. It said the length of the cylinder is a half meter and the length of the cylinder is one meter. Uh, that doesn't make any sense. No, that's right. So what it should have said is the diameter of the cylinder is a half meter and the length is one meter. And when you do the problem, include the sides of the cylinder and the two ends of the cylinder, the sides and the two ends of the cylinder. The third example problem, or the Homer problem, 176, I changed the material from the one given in the problem to fire clay brick. And I had an email that said, where do I get K for fire clay brick from a student working the problem on the weekend? And I said, go to the appendix. You'll find fire clay brick in the appendix, the K value. So go to the appendix to find that. Now, <clears throat> if you happen to miss a lecture by, for some good reason, you can always go online to the ME department videos or YouTube and find my heat transfer lectures there. They was done three years ago. <coughs> It turned out the audio and the visual quality was not really that good. But they're online right now. So you can go there and find almost the identical lecture on those videos that I did three years ago. We're retaping them because we want better audio and video quality. Okay. But you can go right now to the videos and look at my lecture today. <coughs> It'll look just like this one. But I hope you keep coming to class because if you don't, my ego is trashed. And I don't want my ego to be trashed, okay? I want you, I want you here, <laughs> okay? Th those videos are great when you're studying for midterms and a final because if you say, gosh, what happened back in January? I, I forgot that lecture. You can go back there and, and review that lecture. So it really helps when you're studying for things like that, midterms and, uh, and uh, final exams. Okay, now we're going to finish chapter one today. Uh, and here's the problem we're going to work with those two equations up there. The uh, problem, these problems come out of the textbook. We have two possible textbooks, it depends which one you have, um, but they come out of the textbook. Because I'm not sure what textbook you have, I'm going to try and explain in very much detail what these problems say. So this problem is a, is a duct, a rectangular duct like the HVAC duct in the wall up there. Uh, we're going to try and heat air in that duct. Air is flowing in that duct. To heat the air, we're going to put a heating element on the bottom surface of the duct. That heating element could be something like this with two wires coming out and you put this guy uh, across some power supply and it'll generate heat it'll generate so many watts per square meter. And you attach that to the bottom side of the duct, and now you heat the bottom duct wall, which then in turn heats the air going through the duct. Okay, we call that heat flux Q naught double prime. Here is, I took a piece of the wall out to show you. And that's up here. So take a piece of the bottom wall out. Here's the duct wall, bottom, bottom duct wall. The heating element is attached to the bottom of the duct wall. 
below the duct, below the heater, it's perfectly insulated, assumed to be perfectly insulated, which means no heat gets out the bottom. We're given the duct wall thickness, 10 millimeters. We're given the K value of the duct wall, 20. We're given H convection coefficient. We're given the free stream fluid temperature, where it's air. And we're given Ti, which is up here. Ti is the top of the duct wall. Now this is the bottom of the duct, of course, the bottom of the duct. We call T naught the temperature by the heater itself. T naught is the temperature of the duct wall at the heater location. We're asked to find what is, our, what is the necessary heat flux for this problem? The necessary heat flux. Q naught double prime. Okay. Any questions on the picture? Okay. Um, now, we, we're going to start this by looking at these energy balance equations. I'm going to start out with the simpler one, the surface energy balance, and I'm going to do that for the, uh, I think I'll do it for the top up here. So I'm going to draw a picture here. Uh, okay, let's take this like this. So here's the duct wall. That's the duct wall right there. This is the heater. Wall, K value, air. My control volume. Surface control volume for upper surface, for upper surface. Okay, <clears throat> here's the upper surface. I take my control volume for the upper surface. Surface control volume. What comes in goes out. What now? Let's just, first thing you want to do for any problem is trying to understand what's going on. If you don't understand it, there's very little hope to get anything solved for correctly. Okay. <clears throat> Heater's hot, of course. Heat comes out of the heater. Where do you want it to go? To the air, to heat the air. To get to the air, what does it have to go through? Uh, the wall by conduction and convection from the free surface on top. <coughs> conduction through the wall, convection to the air. So for my little surface control volume, I have conduction coming in. and I have convection going out. Q double prime conduction equal Q double prime convection. Conduction is K, hot temperature, T naught, cold temperature, Ti, divided by the length or the thickness of the object. This is L, of course. <coughs> Convection, H. T surface, T I. T fluid, T infinity. Okay, there's my energy balance on the top surface. I'm going to write several of these, so I'm going to just write down the energy balance on the lower surface. So our surface uh, energy balance on lower surface. All right, same picture. I'm going to make this a little bigger so you can see it more clearly. Heater, wall, air.
here's the lower surface. Control volume. All the heat leaving the heater, well, let's put it this way. None of the heat leaving the heater is going to go down. Perfectly insulated means no heat transfer in a downward direction. That means all the heat has to go up into the wall. So what comes into here is into the wall by the heater. So Q not double prime. Once it gets there, what does it do then? It goes out by conduction. Q double prime conduction. Okay, Q not double prime equal Q conduction double prime K, same as this, T naught minus T and Ti divided by L. I'll, I'll write one more. I'll write an energy balance on the total wall. So energy balance on the wall control volume. Okay. Heater. Wall. Air. Now my control volume is the whole wall. Okay. What comes in the bottom? It comes in from the heater. Q not double prime. What goes out the top? Convection. Q convection double prime. Is there any generation in there? No. Is a steady state? Yes. E dot G zero. E dot storage, zero. What does that say? Energy that comes in must equal the energy that goes out. What energy comes in? Q not double prime. What energy goes out? Q convection double prime. Q not double prime equal H T. Hot temperature in the wall. Hot temperature is the bottom, T not. It's by the heater, of course. T naught. Cold temperature, Ti. Uh, T infinity, pardon me. Convection. Okay. Um, now, try and solve for something. Okay, I'm going to take the surface energy balance on the lower surface. Put a check mark by what you know. I know K. I know TI. I know L. Uh, I don't know T naught. And I don't know Q naught double prime. One equation, two unknowns, won't work. Sorry, try, try again. Okay, I'll try this one then. Uh, check mark, check, 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 check. Check, check. One equation, one unknown. Ah, good, I like that one. Solve that guy. T naught, 87.8. Eight. Okay. Uh, I think I'll try the last one, this control, uh, control volume of the whole wall. What do I know? H, I know T naught now. I know it, I know it, good, solve for this. Put those guys in there, 5,500 watts per square meter.
Now, you say, well, how about this one? Isn't this a good one too? Sure it is. Once I find T naught, I'll put T naught in here. And I'll solve this guy. Okay. Same answer. Well, that's because I wrote three equations. How many unknowns are there? There's two. Q naught double prime and T naught. How many equations do I need to solve for the two unknowns? Two. I wrote down three just to show you that there, there's many choices you can make. These equations aren't independent. If I take this one, and I see the H, T, uh, this should be, I got my H wrong there. I got my H, T, I, oh, I'm, I want T, I, pardon me. That's T, I, excuse me. That should be T, I up here. I had the wrong one. That's okay. Same answer. Uh, if I wanted to, you know, like, like three equations, two unknowns, what does that mean about my equations? They're not independent. If I take this guy, see this term right here, they're the same. Okay, so this H is equal to Q naught double prime. Put that up here. This equal Q naught double prime. Same thing, same thing. Or you can subtract these two equations and you'll get this equation. They're not independent. They're not independent. But my point is, sometimes in an exam situation in which you're under time stress and you don't know where to start a problem, what you should do is just write down some equations you think might work. Stare at them, you say, I can't solve that guy, there's two unknowns. Okay, fine, stop. Write another equation down, look at it. This one, oh yeah, I got him. Then I'll take that answer and I'll put it down here. That helps you to write equations down on exam. You don't get quite as stressed on exam if you stare at them. And then you might say, I don't see it right now. That's okay. Come back in 15 minutes. And then the answer might be, oh, now I see it. But writing the equations down is critically important. Okay, so three different control volumes. Two surface and, and one that's control surfaces and one's a control volume. Okay, so that ends up chapter one. Now we spend the next four chapters, two, three, four, and five, on conduction. That's a long time because conduction is very important. It, chapter two is titled Introduction to Conduction, of course. Okay, so we're gonna look at that first. So first thing in chapter two, in chapter one, we pretty much heated, uh, treated um, Fourier's law in one dimension. In our case, it was X. But in general, heat conduction is in three different directions in rectangular X, Y, and Z. So let's start out with chapter two then. Q double prime, this is the vector notation, minus K unit vector I or in shorthand vector notation, the del operator, K del T. So in general, conduction, of course, we know that, occurs in, 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 in three directions, X, Y, and Z, in a typical solid, rectangular solid. Um, we're gonna pretty much focus on 1D heat conduction, although in chapter four, we will look at 2D heat conduction. That's, that's as deep as we go into conduction, one chapter four on two-dimensional conduction. We, we won't do any kind of 3D stuff in this first introductory course to heat transfer. Uh, <clears throat> so now we're gonna look at K in more detail. And we looked at it very quickly in chapter one. We said, if you wanna 
the K, K is the thermal conductivity of property of, of the material. I told you it's in the back of the book, but in chapter one they give you the values for the homework problems. So let's see what K means uh, in a solid. So we'll look at solids first. Transport of thermal energy by two modes. First, lattice vibrations. Number two, free electron migration. If it's a solid, the, it's a lattice structure. So if the atoms start to vibrate on the lattice structure, then the energy is transported to its neighbors. One starts to vibrate, neighbors start to vibrate, and so on, and so on, and so on. Some solids, though, also have free electrons, which help the conduction of thermal energy, because those free electrons have kinetic energy, and they bump into others, and they transfer that kinetic energy to other uh, electrons. So you get transport of energy that way. Th these free electrons occur typically in good electrical conductors. So a good electrical conductor turns out to be also a good thermal conductor. So copper wires, great electrical conductor. What does that mean? I expect copper wires to be good thermal conductors. Of course it's good. Copper conducts heat really well. Aluminum wires, oh yeah, they're okay. They conduct electricity, but not as well as copper. But aluminum is also a good conductor of thermal energy. So as long as they're good electrical conductors, they're, they're gonna be good thermal conductors. Okay, let's take a look at what happens with a uh, liquid. Oh, take the typical one, you know, water, maybe oil. So this has thermal energy transport. by kinetic energy collisions and of the molecules There are um, strong bonds between them. They're closely spaced and they have strong bonds, the molecules. Water, for instance. You heat water and when it's heated, these molecules start to move with kinetic energy. They impact or have a collision with a neighbor and transfer that energy. And it continues that way. Okay. Uh, gases, same as above, but they have weak bonds. They're spaced further apart in a gas, so there's less chances of collisions occurring, so you don't get 
the transport of thermal energy in a gas that you do in a liquid. I mean, you know, you take a glass of water and dump it on the floor, I'll see a puddle down there. Take a glass of air and dump it on the floor and I don't know where it went, it's gone, it's disappeared. Because the bonds are weak, they just spread out. They don't, they don't stay together. Okay, so that's pretty much uh, what's happening with those three. Let's take a look at, so you get an idea of um, <clears throat> how these guys look when I put them on a little graph here. This is, this is in the textbook figure 2-4. So I have a x-axis here, which is k. Point oh one. Point one. One. Ten. Hundred. All right, so typically gases occur in this range somewhere around 0.02 to maybe 0.3. And let's just take <clears throat> typical liquids. They occur from about 0.2 to about 8. 0.2 to about 8. Uh, <clears throat> alloys occur from about 11, 10 or 11 out to maybe uh, 150. So alloys and pure metals from maybe around 50 on up to uh, 500. Uh, Non-metallic solids from about 0.3 to about 50. That gives you a rough guide on the thermal conductivity of these various substances. And if I want, <clears throat> I can make a, I'll just take some typical materials, typical substances, <clears throat> solids, liquids, gases like that. So this is K values, range of K values. I'm going to take copper first. Pure aluminum, carbon steel, stainless steel, Glass, water, oil, and air. K, copper, 400. Aluminum, around 24. Carbon steel. Aluminum 2, that should be 240. Carbon steel, 60. Stainless steel, 15. Glass, 1.4. Water, 0 
oil, 0 0.15, air, 0 0.025. So there's a range of values of, uh, of those. Uh -huh. So it seems like um, materials get to be more conductive or less conductive as they become more energetic, mm -hmm. but do plasmas then become more uh, thermally conductive or no? Like what? Give me an example. What? So um, like if you had <coughs> like in incandescent or not incandescent, okay. these or lights. Too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Is that plasma then more thermally conductive than just a gas? How does it light up? By yes, yeah, the answer is yes. Uh, yeah, because it, it, it's interacting. It typically starts from one and goes to the other. Yeah, it's it's again the collisions and things. Now, just so you understand, we can only have conduction if the uh, liquids and gases aren't moving. Uh, okay, so these aren't. This is not water in motion. This is perfectly still, called quiescent. Perfectly still water, perfectly still air, cannot move. Like you say, I've got a, I've got a 1960s home and the windows are single pane glass. And I'm, I'm trying to be more energy efficient, so I'm gonna go out and spend some money and, and get dual pane windows for my house to cut down on my energy loss in the wintertime. So um, <clears throat> I go out and I, I look at them and I look at the, how they're made and they're made with two glass panes. Okay, well that's good news so far. Two glass panes are better than one glass pane. They're heavier, they cost more, but that's, so, that's the right part of the trade-off. Two glass panes. But you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna put those two glass panes really close together. And there's air between those two glass panes. Now, if that air moves in there, I'm in trouble because it's no longer conduction, it's convection. So I don't want convection. So I want to get those two glass panes so close together, the air's not going to move. You know the old story about fluid mechanics. You got a pipe, you want to create more resistance for the flow, you make the pipe diameter smaller. More resistance, less flow goes through. Same thing for the glass. You get those two glass panes together, there's a lot of resistance to flow. Air doesn't move easily. In this room right now, that wall's warmer. It's outside facing the sun. That wall's cooler. It's facing the hall. The air over here, the temperature of the air close to the wall is higher. Its density goes down. If its density goes down, its buoyancy goes up. The warm air rises on the window side of the room, goes across the ceiling, to the hall side wall, which is cooler, okay, its density then goes up, buoyancy goes down, the heavy air falls down to the floor and makes a circuit, assuming the HVAC is turned off. So we have a circuit of air in here from there. Now, the closer we bring these walls together, the less air is going to move until if we get them close together, the, uh, the air is almost st perfectly still. You can't get too close together. Your apartment's near a freeway complex and you have big trucks and so on, vibration, and the glass might hit each other like that. Or the earthquake comes in California and you know that. You don't want that, but you want to get it close enough together where the air is not moving much at all, if at all. And that's your double pane window glass there. So yeah, the whole point is if you can keep water and air from moving, that's a great, uh, it could be a great insulation. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you want, you can go ahead and uh, combine glass and air and get what we call glass fiber. Insulation. K is in, in the range of 0 0.040. Wow, wow, we just invented something fantastic. If you, can get, if you can get air not moving by combining it with glass, what does that mean, glass fibers? Glass fibers, that's why it's called glass fiber insulation. 
Combine this 0.025, combine 1.4, what do you get? 0 0.040, wow, congratulations. You just got something great. Yeah, there it is. Fiberglass insulation, I don't know, put in your attic, whatever, it's, put it around pipes. Yeah, what is it? It's a bunch of little glass fibers, little tiny glass fibers, and they're arranged in layers. Layer after layer after layer after layer. There's a layer. They're layered. Yeah. Don't get it wet. You get it wet, you're in deep trouble, okay? Deep trouble. Don't get it wet. Don't step on it. If you compress it, you've lost all the insulation because you force the air out of these little gaps. So the point is that you've got a bunch of spaghetti fibers like this. And then you've got like this. And the whole point is you want to trap air in these little spaces like this. You want to trap air in spaces like that. Because if you can do that, you've got a great insulator. Lightweight, okay. It's not that expensive. Great stuff, okay. Or you, you could, um, let's say you're going to Mammoth skiing in February. And you say, I better go get a, a good sleeping bag because I'm going to be in this cabin which isn't heated very well. And so you go to the sporting goods store and you say, um, <clears throat> I'm going to Mammoth skiing in February. I need a good sleeping bag. The guy says, well, they're on the wall over there. The, the, the cheaper ones are there and expensive ones are over there. I said, well, okay, well, can you explain me like what the difference is? Well, that one's good to minus 10. That one's good to minus 20. That one's no, uh, uh, to, uh, let's just say, 20 degrees, that one's good to 35 degrees Fahrenheit. He said, okay, well, but what's inside of him? He says, well, if he, if he knows stuff, he says, well, these guys over here in the middle, this is, these are trade names. Uh, it could be Polar Guard, Qualifil, Holofil. These are all fillings on sleeping bags. Polar Guard, Qualifil, Holofil, and others. They're called hollow filament polyester fibers. They're siliconized to repel water. You don't want water in there. Water destroys all insulations. No, bad news. They're either in sheets or sometimes they're loose filled in sleeping bags. In sheets or loose fill. So yeah, uh-huh, and, and some of these things look like this. Um, that's why they're called hollow fill. They're little fiberglass pellets like this and they're hollow but they have these little like radial pieces like that. They're about the size of that black pen point there. That's how big they are, okay, that pen point. What they do? Oh, they trap air in those little areas right there. So if you sleep on them at night, you crush them down a bit, but then the morning they pop back to their original shape. Great, that's what you want. You don't want to be squashed and stay flat. You've lost all the air in there then. They pop back up. The guy says, okay, um, those, that's great. How about that expensive one over there? He says, well, that's a special one, he says. That's called a down jacket. The guy says, well, what, what's a down jacket? He says, well, <clears throat> that one inside of there, there's, there's down feathers. And the guy says, oh, where do they come from? He says, well, ducks and geese. And the guy says, how did they get those? And the guy says, don't ask me. I don't want to go about through that. That's not a good topic to discuss. Yeah, they're down. ducks can be on a lake in spring of water. The temperature in the lake is 40 degrees and the duck is happy because the duck's insulated from that cold water. How? Well, the duck has three kinds of feathers. Flight feathers for their wings, farm feathers for their body and their head, and down feathers close to their skin. And the down feathers are very, very tiny. I threw it away now, but there's, yeah, here it is. They're even smaller than that. My wife's got a down jacket, and when she sits in my car and I have black upholstery, she has a little cut in her down jacket. And uh, next day I'll find little tiny down feathers on the black upholstery. They're that size. That, that's how big the duck's feathers are, close to their skin, that big. Now those, those down feathers are the ones that trap air. They look like that. They trap air, okay? That's why you always see a duck doing this. They're fluffing those feathers up so they get air in them. They gotta get air because they, they, they can get compressed by sitting. 
So they fluff them up so they get air in those tiny feathers. Yeah, so the lesson is quiescent air, not moving, is a great, great insulator. Now, there's one more property which is interesting, and that property is called thermal diffusivity. So let's just mention that real quick. called alpha. Alpha is K over rho CP. Now, in words, I'll put down what the words mean here. So, materials that have a high value of alpha means that they conduct heat easily by conduction, K, but they don't store much. Small denominator, big numerator. They conduct heat easily, but they don't store. So aluminum, 7 times 10 to the minus 5th. meter square per second. Concrete, now concrete doesn't conduct heat very well, but it stores a lot of energy because it's massive. Uh -huh. Elmo, you said you don't, we don't want water within like the stuff. What about, where does wool fit in? Because it's known for keeping you warm even when wet. It's just, wool's, you know, sheep, it's great for trapping air, right? Look at it, look at a piece of wool, it's great. So yeah, it's also good. Not as good as down feathers though. Yeah, try and find K of, of wool. Let me know next time we come to class. Okay. Yeah, Google it and see what you get. It might be in the back of the book even. I think it is, I think it is. In the appendix. Uh, concrete, uh, 0 0.05. 10 to minus fifth. Well, what does that mean? It's an important, first of all, it's an important property in heat transfer. It is a property because it's a combination of three properties, K, Rho, Cp. So here's a game to play with your friends, non-engineering people maybe. Say, you know what, here's an uh, aluminum plate here, okay, switch plate. Here's a concrete wall. You tell them, close your eyes. Put one finger on the aluminum, one finger on the concrete. Which one's colder? The guy says, oh, yeah, the aluminum's colder. I say, okay. Do you really believe that in this room? Is there a little mini refrigerator behind that thing keeping that plate cold? No. It, it, is there electrical heating wires in the wall keeping the wall hot? No. Conclusion, I guarantee you they're the same temperature. But something's fooling you. I heard there's a, a story similar to that with uh, diamond miners because I guess diamonds have the nickname of something like ice or something because mm -hmm. if you lick a diamond, even oh. though it's the same temperature as like the surrounding yeah. area, because it's, it's so conductive, it pulls the heat out of your... Probably explained by this mm -hmm. because it's explained by this. Well, my, my fingertips are the same temperature, okay, all of them are. They're warm. I put it on here, aluminum. The aluminum sucks the heat out because K is big. Aluminum, big alpha, K is big. But aluminum is not a good storage media. So the heat comes out of my fingertip, my nerve endings, goes through the aluminum, okay, but it's not stored in the aluminum. Now I put my fingertip on the concrete. Concrete, low K, doesn't conduct into the wall at all. The heat stays around my fingertip. And the heat, concrete, can store. So the heat from my fingertip is stored around my fingertip in the concrete 
And so my nerve endings say, no, that's warm. My nerve endings are not good temperature sensors then, right? These guys aren't good temperature transducers. Okay, so that, that's kind of what that means, the thermal diffusivity. We'll use that a lot in our four conduction chapters. So we had a good stopping point for today. Don't forget, homework is due on Wednesday.